Hello, and welcome to another Project Catalyst conversation with me, Kim Clyden. As farming faces more challenges through climate, global market forces and sustainability, how can the agricultural sector continue to improve productivity and profitability? Technology increasingly plays a vital role in increasing efficiency and automating everything from irrigation to labour requirements. The development and implementation of precision agriculture or site-specific farming has been made possible by combining the Global Positioning System or GPS and Geographic Information Systems GIS. Over the last two decades, GPS has become standard on farm machinery. Tractors, harvesters and implements all connected to deliver section control, variable rate applications and record keeping. But are we utilising all its capabilities? With more than two decades in the ag sector, precision farming specialist Barry Cross is keen to help farmers get the best out of their technology and their business. I can cover anything from oh, electrics on harvesters and tractors to hydraulics, pumps, um, water irrigation. I've worked on centre pivots to control them. Um, but my you know, bread and butter has been um, GPS, steering tractors, um, application control, you know, all these sorts of things that comes and, and that is encompassed by precision farming. So recently I've been lucky enough to go more so onto the data side, um, which is which is for me been a slight step back off the tools, but uh, one that I've, I've welcomed and I'm really enjoying. Yeah, it's something that I've, I, I did have a passion for and this was an opportunity for me to follow that passion down that, that road. Through the adoption of GPS, which has been you know, pretty long over the last couple yep. of decades, we've seen various applications being used, particularly yep. by growers, but minimal across the board. What would yep. you say is the most common challenge growers face in adopting this type of technology? Dad. <laughs> uh, that's probably a horrible thing to say, but in the early days it was everyone could drive straighter than these things. Now, look, I've installed yeah, thousands of GPS systems and I've never taken many off. So once you get, once you can show the benefit to the farmer about how it can assist them, especially farmers don't account, account their time as valuable, whereas this actually says to them, it is valuable and here's how we can save it for you. So once you can get that across the line with them, especially if it comes with a monetary value saving, um, a lot of farmers then start to really, really jump on board. It's really good. So precision farming initially was this big game where it was going to save you thousands of dollars instantly. Nowadays, it's little savings. So if we can save you two, three, four thousand dollars a year on your on your chemical or fertilizer bill over ten years, that's a lot of money. So that's that's where the aim and where the big benefit in this precision farming is nowadays. Yeah. Technology wasn't really affordable to adopt in the early stages. How much has that changed over the last couple of decades? It ebbs and flows. Um, I remember we did the. Um, first GPS or well, the first Trimble GPS steering system in Australia and it was just a touch over about $170,000 for this system. Um, nowadays you'd find that's down a, a lot more and it and it comes with competition. At the time there was really only one one system. Now um, all your big players in the in the tractor market it's a standard option. You basically have to untick the box to not get it to come in the tractor. For better or for worse, it's, it's, um, it's certainly helped the farmer's back po pocket, but it also breeds or, or accelerates how fast the products move. Because all of a sudden, instead of one guy developing it, it's a race to beat the next guy to beat the next guy. So it's been really good and, and it's really exciting in the fact that all these big companies are starting to push money into, into precision farming, which for years was the little brother of everything else. Adoption, particularly through innovative or early adopt adoption farmers, yep. has been you know, quite good. Yep. And they're now exploring the gamut of what GPS can offer them. Yep. How far has it expanded now and how many growers are actually taking up those extra steps? Locally here in the Burdekin, um, look, it would be, it would be a, a high percentage of farmers that have steering at minimum. Of the guys that, um, that are going that next step and using a variable rate fertiliser or, or you know, for their nutrient applicants or their chemical stuff, um, I was actually very shocked to realise that it's not as much as you'd think. So I would have thought that it would be 50% of the people that have a steering system would have this stuff and it's not. It's probably down around 30%. It is really that low. So um, it's something that people know about and they know the worth of it, but at the moment, you know, their ground drive's working, so they just stick with that sort of stuff. Whereas um, 
the guys that are using it and they're doing it correctly, uh, they're really reaping the rewards of that efficiency that comes with, with using a variable rate technology or, or you know, um, a, a chemical flow spray applicator. So, yeah. What sort of efficiency gains are we talking about though, percentage wise? Um, percentage wise, so a general application would be anywhere between 10 to 15 per cent. Um, once you get a variable rate controller, you can work on numbers around about 5 to 10, somewhere there. Um, and we're working on new technology using scales and dynamic calibrations, and we're looking at getting to 2% or below um, for our, especially for our granulated um, fertilizers. So yeah, that's, it's an exciting area, yeah. There's been a lot of development in the technology. What role have you played in maybe pulling some of the technology together and creating something new we haven't seen before in the industry? Um, so two years ago, I was working for the local Queso H dealership. And uh, we had a guy that come in and he wasn't happy with his five to seven percent with his granular um, fertilizer. So what we did is I went out and I found a scaling system that would integrate with his variable rate controller. Um, obviously, the guys from where I was working for from Queso H were very helpful in, in steering me in the right directions to bibs and bobs that would work together. Um, after that, we, we installed the scaling system, connected it to his variable rate controller, and now he is outputting through a dynamic calibration situation where he can output his fertiliser and calibrate his, his output at the same time. Um, he's down to under 2% in, in what he's outputting. So yeah, it's been, it was a big, pretty big success, yeah. yeah. Have you done the conversion financially of what that saved? No, <laughs> I should have done all these things, but at that time in what we call dealer land where you're just installing and fixing and all this sort of stuff, I didn't care about that. I just cared that the scales worked and that they did what we wanted them to do. Looking back now in the position I'm in now, I wish I had have taken the couple of days to sit there and just log everything that happened, turn them off and do a, do a test run for a day, turn them on. Um, we probably can still get to that and, and it will happen. We have recently funded some, some uh, guys in the Vertican for more of these systems. So I'd say we'll start to get some rock solid data coming out of that in the, in the near future, in the next 12 months or so, yeah. yeah. Innovation is one thing, but how many more efficiencies can we make in, across the landscape of sugarcane and agriculture? There's still stuff out there. Um, I mean, through yield monitoring and, um, and soil, soil mapping, soil sampling, there's definitely a long way where we can go, especially around ameliorates and um, mill nut application, but also around our fertiliser. So a lot of farmers, are, um, like we spoke to a guy just this afternoon, and he's manually dropping his rate when he gets to a bit where he knows it doesn't need as much fertiliser. So that, with the use of yield mapping and, and soil sampling, we can, we can actually make him do that on his own. So um, it's saving him, not only is it saving him fertiliser, but it's saving him the time and everything to actually physically go and do that. So um, look, every time I think that we've come to the end of the road of precision farming and there's nothing else that we can do, they throw another thing at you and there's the next, the next step and the next, the next thing to get, up, get going with. So it's, it's never going to stop. Considering you, you were able now to integrate systems that yep. aren't even related or were talking to each other in the past, yep. how can you apply that and, and what then can you begin to implement beyond what we're actually using right now into the future? Well, I suppose, look, every, every step we take is, is nearing us towards that magic word of autonomy. So whether we ever get there in cane farming, that, that's probably the final goal. And I think something as simple as, as that, and, and although it was, you know, it may not seem simple to everyone, but it is a fairly simple scaling system that just goes onto a fert box. With the use of that, there's no reason why that job can't become autonomous in the, you know, in the next five to 10 years. I mean, we've all seen autonomous tractors, the big players in the tractor market are already bringing it in and, and spruiking it. So look, I think that's the way it's all slowly heading to, to, yeah, especially with labour costs and everything, that's the way it's slowly heading. Autonomy is, is the way we're going slowly. What yeah. role does government play in that and advancing that stage? Because I understand at this stage autonomous tractors aren't necessarily something the government's approved in this country. They haven't been approved yet. Um, there is a lot of red tape around it and understandably so. I mean, the last thing you want is one of these things burning down the main road, you know, with no one sitting in there to tell it what to do. Um, look, I think the technology is good enough now that that it can work um, and we're there and we have been for years and and um, look red tape is red tape and I, I think if if it gets to the point where it gets proven enough 
it will be okay. And you know, like everything, it's just sort of one of those steps that has to be taken, and, and it will it will happen eventually. Yeah. Speaking of government, what role do you think the do you think the regulations play and the regulatory you know footprint yep. in farming has yep. on the adoption and the advancement of the technology oh, you're huge. servicing? It's huge, and and so regulatory things change, and what happens is they say, okay, well, how can we make this more efficient now? You know, so let's come up with a way that all of a sudden helps us to, to be more efficient with how we use this product or this whatever. Um, and yeah, it definitely, it definitely grows that whole precision farming um, sector. You are working, or you are working with one of our project catalyst growers, Robert yep. Panassi, whom we yep. spoke with earlier today. Yes. How does working with someone who's an early adopter of a lot of yep. you know, technology assist you in delivering someone in a community that can then network and influence with other farmers? Uh, it's huge and not only, you know, like it's great to be able to, um, to talk with someone like Rob, like Rob and I are actually nerding out and talking about actual precision farming things and what we can do and how we can do this and it's a passion that he, sh he shares with myself and um, you don't be in this game for as long as I have if you don't enjoy it. And, in terms of, of Rob, he's a great advocate because if you do good work, he'll tell people and he'll let them know that you do good work and, and he'll spruik it for you. So it's, a, it's very advantageous for us as well to work with someone of, of the calibre of Rob and, and especially what he's done. Rob's someone that loves to try things. So he's done things with mill mud, he's done things with variable rate, um, you know, prescriptions, he's done all these sorts of things and he's doing them ahead of the curve. So before they become a thing, Rob's the one there doing them and trialling them, you know, and, and he's putting in the hard yards and then, you know, the poor bugger, everyone comes in and says, oh, what a great idea, let's, uh, let's go put this on everything else. So um, that's, that's where he's, you know, and you say he's ahead of, ahead of the curve and all this stuff and it's just because he's interested in it and it's something that he sees can add a value to his, to his business, which, which I think at the end of the day, if you're helping that, um, I mean, it's a good passion to have. There's, there's worse things you could do than trying to help your business. So. Barry Cross speaking to the applications of GPS currently used by many farming enterprises. Robert Benassi purchased his first GPS 10 years ago for traffic control, essentially keeping his machinery on the inter-row space without compacting or damaging the grow zone of his sugarcane. You could um, utilise the full width of the implement because you had your full width of the implement set up in your GPS, so you had no overlapping and it was really hard that for my father to grasp the area where he could see it was exactly the same width as what we were doing every pass. And um, so as the years moved on, we, um, we, we shifted from GPSing on farming. I put my first GPS in my cane harvester and, um, and could see the benefits from that as well, uh, where you could, the driver could actually start operating the machine, had a lot more time in his hand where he wasn't over concentrating on just trying to drive that machine. So we did that. Um, my son entered the scene where he said, Dad, we've got all this technology, why don't we do more with it? So about five years ago, we bumped into Barry up in a Mariba field day and he was actually doing exactly what we really wanted to do. And um, that was actually do some mapping, um, boundary lines, and be able to utilise the information from one machine to another machine to the harvester so they all go to that block and it was all set up. And now we've, um, we have all mapping, boundaries put in and we can track wherever one of my machines are, like we track their cane harvester which is harvesting about an hour west of us in Abigarry and we could see exactly what that machine was doing and which block he was harvesting and so there, there's some sort of the benefits that we're utilising out of our GPS of today. Um, I do intend now that I have a rate controller and stuff on the farm. We rate control our billet planner as well, that eventually we'll probably put that and overlay that over the mapping, utilising more out of the GPS. In relation to record keeping and water quality, how do you see that making things like simplifying processes for you as well, having it all recorded in GPS? Like I'm still a bit old school, I'm doing a lot of paperwork trail, um, but I can see myself in the next 12 months getting a, a laptop or a computer and once you're logging it onto there where you can pull it off the tractor and put it onto there or just transfer it and, and it's there. And um, then if you still want to do a paper trial, you can just pull it off that or if someone wants to come and have a look at something that's on the screen and that's just another 
advantage of having the GPS where you can, today you can just, just either put it on a stick or that's probably the simplest way and plug it in and it's transferred across. So. How often have you been audited since the regulations applied? Well, I'm up for my five years um, BMP accreditation, so, which is happening in the next couple of weeks. So, yeah, had it been all on file on the computer, well, it would have been a lot bit easier, but this guy's just going to have to go through my paper trail and work it all out. <laughs> yeah. Barry Cross said the focus is on GPS guidance, boundaries and integrating software systems. So we're seeing definitely more and more probably farm management based software becoming a thing. So especially as, as all these regulations get, get harder and firmer, it's easier to let the GPS and let your precision farming stuff do all the hard, hard work and heavy lifting. So if it means that you don't have to go down and, and type 500 things into a spreadsheet because it's already logged, then I mean that's great. So recently this year we had someone get chemical audited. Um, we were logging all of his stuff to his online platform and all we had to do was just show the, the officer this stuff and it, everything was green ticked almost instantly. So um, it just takes a lot of stress out of it, you know, for the, for the grower. And I think that sort of stuff is, is huge and, and every, every company is, is doing that stuff and it's available to everyone um, and a lot of it's free. So, you know, if you're not doing something down that path, it's probably time to start looking into it now because in the next five or 10, these are gonna be the, the big things that save you time. Thanks for listening to our Catalyst conversation with GPS specialist Barry Cross from Aglantis and Project Catalyst grower Robert Benassi from Ingham. For more stories like this, connect with us on our website, projectcatalyst.net.au and social media channels. You'll find us on YouTube, Facebook and LinkedIn. Project Catalyst is funded by the partnership between the Australian Government's Reef Trust and the Great Barrier Reef Foundation and the Coca-Cola Foundation with support from WWF Australia.